Thank you so much. I'm, I'm getting way too much credit for this course because John Marshall, where, where, John, who was out, John just did so much more work than I did on this course, and it was, just wasn't very seen. Um, it's absolutely remarkable what, what, to hear stories from people in this room about how the course has been used, and thank you so much for using it and for the encouragement that you all are to me. And I, I bring greetings from kind of everywhere, really. Certainly my church in London, King's Church London, you guys have been a huge encouragement uh, with all that you've been through the last couple of years. And the New Frontiers family more widely, it's just great to be with you. A lot of our relationships go back, you know, 20 years with people in this room. So thank you and we love you. But I, I don't want to, I know that, you, you know, when you've, Donnie's here and he's doing notices so competently, you kind of feel like you want to return it with 15 minutes of encouragement. But I feel like I have to get to the Bible quicker than that because otherwise there won't be any time. Um, so can we, if you have a Bible, can you turn to Numbers chapter 11? And um, I want to, I'm just thrilled by the subject that you've got for this conference, really, of Humbly Onward. I thought it was so brave uh, to, to name a conference that and to go for that as a theme. And I want to speak into why out of the book of Numbers a little bit. And you may know that Martin Luther famously said that the, the human race basically is like a drunk man who climbs on a horse on one side and tries to steady himself and then falls off the other side and then gets back up and then tries to steady himself and falls off again the other side. And then that's what human pe beings do because we find balance incredibly difficult. We don't find it easy to hold a steady line in the middle of something. We see an error that scares us over there and very quickly we're falling into that error over there. And out of desperation not to make the same mistake again, we swing dramatically. Like you see this all the time, right? It's the story of the church. We don't want legalism because we've seen it. So we swing into antinomianism and then we go, oh, no, no, we can't have that. Those people aren't taking the words seriously. They're not living the Christian life obediently. And before you know it, in correcting to that error, they've swung back into, you know, much too heavy. And then, oh, no, we can't do that. And they swing back. That happens all the time. And there's tragically multiple examples of that sort of theological thing going on in the history of the church. And something like that is happening in our generation with respect to leadership. As a, it is a sort of a swing of overcorrection from extreme to extreme. And the way I would tell the story goes a bit like this. The founding fathers of the kinds of churches that most of us are in, and I've been to many of them, and here we go, there's now another 50 to get to know, thinking, wow, I'm not going to get around all of those. But I, my suspicion is that the movement we are and the kind of churches we represent, most of our founding fathers were in churches that originally, back, go back 40, 50 years ago, were underled. And the, the, the pastoral structure, what didn't empower wise, even strong leadership, but what instead happened was the pastor had very little authority, and he was almost always on his own, because churches were mostly small, and stereotypically, and this might be a little unfair, but there'd be one or two in the room who tell you this is what happened, he couldn't do anything without getting it through, A, a board of cantankerous deacons who'd been there for 50 years and didn't want any change and be a congregation who had to vote on everything and those two things made it difficult so having fallen off that side of the horse church has been underled the church then gets back up and goes we've got to overcorrect we've got to we've got to correct against that kind of error we're going to make sure pastors can actually lead so we emphasize spiritual authority and anointed leadership and Ephesians 4 ministries or gifts which we'll talk a bit about tomorrow Congregational voting was thrown out of the window, to which I, I mean, you may not, you may still have it, I don't know, um, I'm just standing here, but I go, yay, that's great, I don't want congregational voting, but also, quite often, a lot of other things that went with the old model got thrown out the window, and maybe not so wisely, so we're like, get rid of, uh, deacons, they're out the window as well, yay, we hate the deacons, we're like, I think they're in the word, but we just chat them out as well, and then we're like, and, and, and sort of any extra ecclesial structures that might help safeguard a church. So we say, oh, no, we've seen what happens when you've got you know, presbyteries and bishops and all this stuff. Oh, get all of, all of those as well. It's just the church. And, and oh, no, don't, anything written down that tells us we well, have to do these things, otherwise pastors are going to exceed. Oh, no, we don't want that. We throw all of that out, that out as well. And quite quickly, all of the checks and balances that much of the historic church had used to prevent churches from going a bit crazy with leadership, were removed in a fit of excitement. And initially it goes okay. And then after a while you think, I think we're exposed here because we've thrown away too many checks and balances. And that's what happens. And over the last few years, we've seen, you know, the, our generation falling off that side of the horse. And it's your, yeah, names you, we would me know, we would know. The Driscolls, the McDonald's, the Highballs, whoever it might be, you just think that this is not 
There's, there's a lack, some lack of wisdom in here, but we've, what we were doing was trying to correct against that, and we've ended up falling off this side. And then, of course, what's now happening is the church going, oh, we can't ever do that again. Let's get back on the horse, and is probably going to fall off the other side um, because the dangers of big, powerful, charismatic leadership are so obvious, and our church culture is swinging back towards a softer, more emollient culture and more cautious or consensual decisions where people are less likely to fall into the pit over here and probably in our generation it will overcorrect the other side because there'll be a generational swing cultural factors and so on well, here's the good news the people of God have had that problem before <laughs> and they've had it in the book of numbers and I want to take you through a bit of the book of numbers because I think it's I, I have a theory I'm, most people past the standard wisdom is pastors are obsessed with numbers they're always talking about numbers, and I'm like, pastors are not talking enough about numbers. They're capital with a capital N. They're not talking enough about the book of numbers. It is a goldmine of pastoral insight. Some of you got it. Okay, that's fine. It's, it's lovely the sort of delayed ripples of giggles that you can see, right? But numbers is a goldmine of pastoral insight for a lot of things, not just this on leadership. But I think it's a goldmine of pastoral insight because the book of numbers typologically Repre you know what I mean by that? Where it's a repre where the way patterns in the old are explored and culminate in the new, the typological structure of the life of the church is really reflected in the book of Numbers in the wilderness generation. That when the apostles are trying to say, hey church, you are here in the Bible story, they generally point to one of two places. They say you're in the wilderness and you're in the exile in Babylon. Those are the two places the apostles reach for. Peter particularly goes for exile, Paul particularly goes for wilderness, but they, they, they kind of draw on those images and say, if you tell the Bible story, that's where the church is. And that's because the, in numbers, the church, the people of God, have just been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb over their door. They've just been baptized in the Red Sea. They've just been given the, baptized in the Holy Spirit. The cloud has descended. They are being led by God through the desert. They've seen their enemies drown. They're celebrating on the back. Saying, this is wonderful. New life is here. And then God says, no, you have a journey to make between your freedom and your inheritance. And inheritance is a land flowing with milk and honey. And it's just over there. But you are going to bump into a couple of things. And I'm going to give you my law. My, and I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to lead you there. But your obedience in the meantime will be a challenge. And in the meantime, I'm going to provide you with shoes that don't wear out. And I'm going to provide you with honey from the rock. I'm going to provide you with water. I'm going to provide you with food from the sky. I'm going to make quail come out of nowhere. I will feed you with my, you might say, my body and blood. I will give you all you need. I will give you spiritual food in the wilderness. But your inheritance is not yet. That day is still to come. And when you cross over in, into the promised land, then you'll finally receive your everlasting rest. And the New Testament regularly does this and says, that's you, right? You're being, the Spirit is with you. You've been baptized. You've been redeemed. Da, da, da. You've got the presence of God with you, leading you on. You will reach the promised land, but you're not there yet. And in the meantime, here's a spiritual meal for you to feast on. Here are spiritual gifts from the heavens to help you on your journey. But there's going to be temptation. And some of you will want to go back because in Egypt they had cucumbers. And others of you are going to want to go forward. And others of you are going to fall out and you're going to grumble and you're going to get what we call church life. And the book of Numbers tells that story. <laughs> so typologically, it's a powerful book, and, and it illustrates the kinds of things that happen in the normal church. So you, you think through your Old Testament bit, story like David, you go, oh, David's a story about idolatry, the temptations of money, sex, and power. Whereas when you read the story of Numbers, you go, this is basically a story about the normal trials and tribulations of pastoral niggles, Right? grumbling, decision-making, leadership succession. Uh, you think you should re really be the leader? I think maybe we should be the leader. Oh, no, what about this? Admittedly, you, most of us don't turn around and say, by the way, the ground's going to swallow you up for that. But that's not normally how it works. But that sort of dynamic of like, just gritty working stuff through and miracles coming in the day and then having to work through conflicts during the, other, the afternoon, that kind of thing. And so in our specific cultural context, Numbers is helpful, and it's particularly helpful because it shows us what happens when the people of God swing from one extreme to the other on the issue of leadership. From overconfident, arrogant pride on one side to underconfident, timid passivity on the other side, and then back, and then back. So, here's the structure of the middle bit of numbers, okay? It, 
The, the nerd, oh, the nerd fest here. Those of you who have been on the course, you'll know I love this kind of, geek out on this stuff. There are seven major rebellions in the book of Numbers, okay? And they are structured in a very specific, cool way. I say cool, I use that word loosely. Um, they're structured in a very specific, I think, helpful way for us, right? There is a grumbling trial at the beginning and the end, all right? So the first and seventh trials are trials of just, it just says the people of Israel, they murmured, they muttered. It's the same word used elsewhere for they meditated. It's like murmuring, just, just repeating it to themselves. But they were, clearly it's a bad word, right? And they grumbled. Then the second and sixth trials are rebellions of unbelief, where they don't trust what God says he's going to do. And we'll come back to what they are in more detail in a minute, but that's the, right? So grumbling, grumbling, unbelief, unbelief, pride, pride to leadership challenges, rebellions of people saying, you should not be leading because we should. And then in the middle, you have the big one, which is the one that most of us know from the middle of Numbers, the child of unbelief, where they are told to go and take the land, and they don't. And actually, that unbelief, then at the very end of the story, turns into presumption. They say, we don't believe God. No, we're not going to go. We're not going to go. And God says, right, that's it. You're going to wait 40 years and, until you've all died. Oh, actually, maybe we will go. And we'll go on our own. Oh, no, 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 no. They all get massacred. It's that kind of presumption. <laughs> so that's the, that's the sort of... Su- summary of the seven trials and numbers. And so what I want to do is just walk through them one at a time so you can see how... Then let's bracket out the grumbling for a moment, but what's happening is the swing from unbelief to pride to unbelief to pride to unbelief and so on. And I think there's a lot of encouragement here for us, but I want to show you that how this plays itself out first and then bring some application, if that's okay. Okay, so as you walk, just let's, we'll walk through these... Um, specific biblical passages, right? So the first trial, grumbling, and this is Numbers 11, verses 1 to 3. Just have a look at Numbers 11, 1 to 3. And the people complained, or, and the people, sorry, got a different translation. Uh, yes, there. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. That's the simplest of the seven. They grumbled, God sends fire, they went, ah, and then God stopped the fire. That's all that happened, right? It's a simple grumble versus, you'd love to have that kind of power in your church when you're right, okay, and there should be fire on that life group, okay. Oh, they're all screaming, okay, let's bring back the fire. It would be great. Sorry, I'm already slipping into the very over-heavy version of leadership I was talking about. Um, there's a reason God doesn't give us that kind of power. But that's the first, that's the first trial. Very simple, I'm not going to dwell on it. The second one. The trial of unbelief, Numbers 11, beginning at verse 4. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but manna to look at. And I, don't, I kind of, that's obviously a little bit grumbly, but at the same time, you, manna does sound kind of dull, doesn't it? Coriander seed resin-like wafer. Does, just eating nothing but that would get to you, and it got to them. And so the promise of quail comes, and the promise isn't just, it's all right, I shall bless them with quail. It's also, yeah, I'm going to bless them with quail, but it's going to come out of their nostrils very shortly. So this is kind of a, a, an answer to prayer that turns into an act of judgment. Be careful what you wish for. But that's the, that's the thread. And in response, you get God's promise, and then Moses says, here am I among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I'll give them meat to eat for a whole month. And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's hand shortened? Now you'll see whether my word will come true for you or not. Now that is a, this is fundamentally a trial of unbelief. It's a trial that the people of Israel don't believe God will provide for them. And actually Moses isn't sure he does either. And in, in combination, it is a trial. Obviously, it's, it's a complaint about food, but it's really a lack of faith. And God identifies it and says, you, do you think the Lord's ha- on, hand is too short to save? That seems to be the problem here. You don't believe I can do what I'm saying I can do. And so it's a trial of unbelief, and it leads to the judgment of the, the effectively the plague that comes upon them. It's called the, the graves of craving. That's the second trial. The third, is this crackling a little bit? Is that me? Am I doing something bad? You think it's okay? Looking for guidance, wisdom? Okay, it's in the back pocket. We'll see. Okay, um, third trial trial of pride. So they, they get up off the unbelief side, right? But then you very quickly end up with the opposite. So instead of st- thinking too little of perhaps what God will do, they start thinking too much about what they are entitled to and they swing to pride. 
And they, this is Aaron and Miriam, and they said, chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. He always does. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. And so later on, God then says this to them, with Moses I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? I just think the word afraid there is interesting because the writer, this is only a few verses after, they've, been so, they've effectively not believed enough and now he's saying, you guys should have been a bit more afraid to speak against Moses. You've got too high a view of yourself. And so the contrast, the kind of trial has changed. It's swung from one extreme to the other. But then in chapters 13 and 14, which is, as I say, the famous bit about the, the conquest of the land and the spies, it swings back to an unbelief problem. So you could read the whole of chapters 13 and 14, but here it is in chapter 14, verses 1 to 2 and 11. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, because they've just heard the news from the spies. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we died in the land of Egypt. Verse 11, And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me, in spite of all the signs I've done among them? Done among them? So again, they're swinging, that's very explicitly a challenge of unbelief. And this is what Psalm 95 comes back to, and Hebrews chapter 4 comes back to. They couldn't enter the land because they didn't believe. So they have, they're swinging from side to side here. It's like, we well, don't, oh no, God's not going to do it. Oh, we're nothing, oh, I can't do it. Through to, actually, yes, I think some of us can do it, and we're going to take you out, Moses. And then that's the next swing. They swing right back again in chapter 16. Uh, if you want to know what happens in chapter 15, you can read it. Um, <laughs> I'm sure some of you have. Um, and in chapter 16 and 17, you end up with a yet another pride challenge where this time it's not, Moses, uh, it's not Aaron and Miriam, it's Korah and Dathan and Abiram. They're guys who form a, a little alliance, it seems, and say, you have gone too far, Moses, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord's among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And Moses responds kind of graciously in the circumstances, but ends up saying, is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you, Korah's a priestly family, he's in fact his descendant, distant descendants write a lot of the Psalms, right? That the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them. And he's brought you near him. And all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you? And would you seek the priesthood also? You guys are too big for your boots. You've been given this astonishing privilege of this sort of representation. And you're saying, it's not enough. I want to be the king. I want to be the, the prophet who goes up the mountain. And if I don't have that, I'm going to complain and I'm going to say, you should stand down in favor of me. So this is a very, it's a classic leadership challenge text. Then, you're getting the hang of this now. It swings back again to another unbelief trial, this time over the water out of the rock. And this is a complex story. I'm not going to get into all the ins and outs about exactly what Moses did wrong and that because there's a lot of writing on that, as you probably know. But what Moses ends up, what God says to Moses is, ultimately the issue here, Moses, is because you didn't believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I've given them. So God's speech to Moses, okay, whether it's about how many times he tapped it and whether he should have struck it or spoken to it, all those debates. I got, put a pin in that for now. What God says the issue is, whatever Moses did, the issue is that he didn't believe God. That's the problem. So we're back in another unbelief problem. And then finally, the seventh trial, back to grumbling. And this is where we end up with, uh, you know, the people of God. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness for there's no, water, no food and no water and we loathe this worthless food? Which is a very contradictory complaint, really. There's no food and we hate the food. You're like, which is it? But they're like, they're the, and so it's basically back to the original problem in chapter 11. But... Again, it's, it's, it's just sort of garden variety grumbling, and this time God doesn't send fire, he sends snakes, which is much scarier, I think. Uh, so you've, God ever sends snakes, you're like, ah, yeah, I wish I was somewhere else. Um, and so that, that's the structure of the, center of the central seven trials of Numbers. I want to make three, I hope, encouraging observations about that. The first is the point I made already, that the pendulum swing we're witnessing today is not a new problem. 
So if you are witnessing it, if you're concerned about it in your own church, in your movement, in wherever you see it, in the nation you're in, and say, man, people are just, they've seen a, a peop, some people go too far this way, and they are massively overcorrecting, and they're going to cause the opposite sort of problem. The answer is, well, yes, they probably are. And that's kind of what often happens in the history of the church and the world. It's not a new problem. It's not the result of mega churches or America or <laughs> millennials. And they, because people do that, don't they? They say this is because of pop culture. It's because of social media. It's because of America. How, have we got any Americans here? <laughs> you, am I right that you guys don't like being blamed for everything? You can be blamed for some things butchering tea, all those things that you just can't do. But you can't be blamed for everything. You can't be blamed for this problem. It's also blamed a lot of the time. It's blamed on millennials. Have we got any millennials in the room? Anybody born after 1982? Hey! Okay, you don't like being blamed for everything either, do you? It's kind of annoying. People say, yeah, because it's millennials. I'm always like, my wife's a millennial. Millennials are like 40 now. I stop talking about them as if they're 11. But it gets blamed on all of these things, and it's not those things. This is an age-old dynamic in the history of the church. This is as old as the Bible. Just hold that one for a moment, if you would. Just hold that one for, for now. Um, that's great. Um, but it's an age-old dynamic. It's always been there. Now, some of those factors, social media, millennials, Americans, goodness knows what, mega churches, they've probably contributed to the way it plays itself out now, as in it looks like it does because of that, but the dynamic at heart is actually as old as the covenant. So that's the first observation. Be encouraged. The church has been here before. The second observation is that we are not ultimately dealing with a spectrum from one end to the other end. We are dealing with, I'm sorry, I used to be a management consultant, a two-by-two two matrix. What do I mean by that, right? So this is the, the, other, the next page, okay? We are dealing with a matrix where basically there are two axes here on, with different things in view on each axis. On one axis, if you can hopefully read, the, 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 the horizontal axis runs from pride to humility. Pride, bad, humility, good. The vertical axis runs from timidity, bad, to courage, good. You might not be able to see it. I hope you, hope you can. But it's all right. Pride at that end, humility at that end, timidity down here, courage up here. And what people can do is they think instead of that, they think it's a spectrum. And basically, at one end of the spectrum is people who have too much confidence and become arrogant. And at the other end is the people who don't have enough confidence and they become timid and unbelieving. And the problem with that, of course, is it makes you always think, oh, I don't want to trust God too much because then I might become too big for my boots. Or I don't want to be, you know, be uh, too self-effacing or else I become too timid. And you think, no, no, no. Humility isn't the kind of thing you have to balance with courage. You actually have to pursue both of them because the horizontal axis is about your view of you and the vertical axis is about your view of God. Right? So the horizontal axis is how much can I achieve? Answer, nothing. The vertical axis is how much can God achieve? And the answer is everything. Now, in practice, we know, what we, we know what we mean. If you were to map someone onto that, you'd say, well, there are actually a bunch of people who in their humility become very timid. And I would call that passivity. And I think the Israelites, we witness that in this story. That a number of these occasions are people are saying, we don't think very much of ourselves, but we also don't really believe God can do it because these people are too big and mighty for us. And Joshua and Caleb aren't saying, no, of course they're not, they're not big and mighty. They're saying, no, these guys are seven foot tall and you guys are minnows. But we've got the Lord God on our side and they haven't. End of conversation. So the contrast there isn't between how well, how well you think you're going to do in a fight. It's not like, I'm going to take them on because I'm so... No, no, no. This is about, you need to recognize you are very small and God is very big. That's the dynamic, right? But if you don't have that, you end up in passivity. You also get Israel. At the end of Numbers 14, you witness the opposite, which is down in the bottom left, where you get people who are timid and proud. And you might think, well, that doesn't make any sense. How could somebody possibly be timid and proud? An awful lot of people are timid and proud. An awful lot of people, because they're so concerned about themselves and what they can do or achieve, then when they look at themselves and think, I don't think this is the right moment for me to make my breakthrough, they back off. Because they've concerned, they're proud, so they look at their own ability, and then they think, this is not going to reflect well on my reputation. So I'm going to hold back. And that's very possible. A lot of people are proud and timid at the same time. And it's also possible to be proud and courageous in a, in a manner of speaking at the same time. And that's what happens at the end of Numbers 14 when the people say, 
where God said to them, you're not going in. And they say, no, all right, God, you know, have you, have you ever seen children do that? You tell them you're not allowed to do this until you clean your room or whatever. And they go, right, like Basil Fawlty, if you're English. Like, right, okay, I'm going to go and do it. And they do everything uh, almost in overreaction to what the, you've told them they can't do. You're saying, no, 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 that ship has sailed. Well, that's what Israel do. And they say, we're going to take the land. They're out of presumption, in pride, mingled with a kind of false courage. They charge into the land and they get wet and massacred. But it's also possible to be in the top right-hand quadrant. And in this story, that's where Joshua and Caleb are. For instance, Joshua and Caleb are not thinking up too highly of themselves at all. They're simply saying, God's promised us this land. That's the issue. It, it, I don't think, I mean, Caleb's an old guy at this point. We, we must sort of imagine him like, um, you know, William Wallace and Braveheart going, I am Wallace, all that kind of, you know, covered in paint. Stuff. They're not really like that. They're not rah, rah kind of characters necessarily. What they are is people who are absolutely convinced of the call of God. And the promises of God. They say, well, God said that this is what's going to happen. I think you actually see that in Moses as well in the, several of the stories. There's a meekness mingled with a courage in him. And Moses is a fascinating character in Numbers because at different points he seems to bobble around all of these quadrants. Doesn't he? He's a, he's, he's, he's a very real person. As you, you know, he's, he's drawn in 3D. Probably Moses and David are the two Old Testament figures, I think, who are the most sort of multidimensional to study as characters. You think, yeah, I buy that. That's, that's what real people are like. You don't get to know very much about all sorts of Old Testament people. But these guys, you think, yeah, that's exactly what people do. Sometimes they're very good at it, and sometimes, oh, no, they're just tired, they've missed it, and so on, and that's what happens. And I think that quadrant, or that, if you, you want to call it that, has a powerful implication for the present moment, both in this movement and in the Western church as a whole, which is that we don't have to push back the pendulum when it swings. I don't think you have to do that. I think people will overcorrect. And I think we probably have to let that happen sometimes on various, not on everything, but on many issues, that probably will happen. That's what generations do. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's our responsibility to push it back. Some people will deconstruct leadership and churches will dis disintegrate. That's bound to happen, that's happening already. And no doubt others, anxious about the fact that deconstructing leadership's happening, will hold too much, they'll hold the line too much and say, no, we're not going to give away any of this and maybe fall into error in other ways and maybe be accused of things and that sort of, that'll probably happen as well. I don't think we need to do either of those things because whichever direction the pendulum swings, it provides an opportunity to grow in humble courage. It's kind of a win-win for the church because when it swings against leadership, it provides an opportunity for repentance leading to greater humility. And when it swings for leadership, it provides an opportunity for courage leading to humble sacrifice. As in both ways, in every generation, you think there's something that leaders can glean and gain. Do you want me to speak? Shall I speak from this one? It's just crack the other one's crackling, isn't it? Is that okay? Am I coming out of this one now? Okay, great. Um, so whichever way the pendulum swings, there's an opportunity for the wise leader to learn from that swing. So you, you, in, in any generation, you will have an opportunity here. Right? The, you, you're challenged by circumstances, and you think this needs to lead us to repentance. And then you'll be challenged by circumstances saying, wow, leadership is very easy in this context. Some of us will live long enough to see the pendulum not just swing this way, but begin to swing back the other way. That's probably in people in this room in their 20s, who by the time they're leading in their 60s, the threat will be, you guys might have too much power. Just the, that's what the church does. We fall, that's Luther's horse. That's what drunk people trying to sit on horses do all the time. Get, get used to it. Just but be discerning with the fact, okay, we're tipping this way. And so if I am in that position, and I am getting a bit too much power and getting a bit and liking it too much and thinking I think the temptation here is for the church to become proud and arrogant again, and that may be a cultural dynamic already in other nations represented here, then there's an opportunity at that point to say, okay, so what a humbly courageous leader does is to sacrifice, to lay things down so that others might rise, to say, I don't want... I got a friend, I don't name drop him, but some, a bunch of you would know who he was. He's, I think, a very impressive leader. And when I spent time with him, I was really struck by this sort of humble courage thing. It's a very sort of strong, bullish kind of, let's go, go for the next thing. Very gifted public guy as well. But I was really struck by a few things when I spent time with him. I went around his house, and it was pretty much the same size as my house. And I thought, I know in this culture how much people in your position are often paid. And I know how much they often have. 
And I just think it's quite impressive to see that you're just living quite really very normally. And then I thought, actually, the way that you've structured your church to make sure you don't have too much power and too much control is actually very wise. And I remember he used this line with me at one point. He said, oh, at the moment, we're the fastest shrinking church in America. Because of what they were, the way they were redesigning their church to make them, and, and he, but he was quite pleased with it. He was just like, "This is great. This is what God's doing." And I, there were a lot of, and it, it actually, and they were the fastest church, the fastest shrinking church in the world, um, until Common Ground. I know we're going to shrink even faster than that by de- devolving into all the. No, but they did. They basically did something similar, and it was kind of encouraging just to think. I'm not sure that you've done any one of those things simply to defend yourself against this pop, this problem. But in combination, those things are protecting you and the people you're here to serve by not allowing the fact that people in your area are, still have a very, very high view of leadership, but you're not going to damage them by, because of some of the wisdom of the choices you're making. And that's, so we, there's an opportunity on every side, whereas those of us, like in my the culture I'm in at the moment, in London, that's not the issue. I'm certainly not where I am. The issue is that the culture will be swinging away from leadership. But again, there's an opportunity to say, yeah, well, where have I, where have we, where's the church just miss this one and so I, I think we don't have to be so worried about pushing the pendulum back at times I think just to say what's God doing in and through this so encouragement number one this has happened before encouragement number two there's actually opportunities for us at both ends of that because it's not ultimately a spectrum it's a quadrant and the third observation is that no amount of unbelief or pride can prevent the blessing of God from being poured out over his people and the reason why that matters in the context of the structure of numbers, if I may make one more nerdy point, is that those seven trials are bookended in between blessings just at the before and blessings just after. Right? In Numbers 6 to 10, it's the, it's the story really of the priestly blessing, the initiation of the priesthood. And so you know, you know the famous lines, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance over you and give you peace. That's in Numbers chapter 6. Then move forward into number 7, 8, 9. As the priesthood is inaugurated, the silver trumpets blast. And then number 10, they move out. And again, they play basically a curse on their enemies and a blessing on their people. They say, arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. And those who hate you shrink before you. And then, of course, they turn to Hobab and extend the blessing to him and say, come with us. We'll do you good. The Lord's promised. That's the end of it. So there's a whole sequence of blessings over the people of God just before this sequence of trials. And Numbers, if you know it well, you'll know that the blessings come, then the seven trials, and then at the end, you end up with the blessing coming again, but this time not coming from a Jewish priest like Aaron, but from a Gentile false prophet, Balaam, who we mostly know because of the donkey story, but you get the same dynamic here where the prophetic blessing again It's like after all of these disasters, the snakes, the earthquakes swallowing people up, Aaron having to stand between the living and the dead just to stop the plague, the people having to look to the bronze snake and find somehow healing from being bitten from these snakes, all of these things that God's had to do to rescue the people from their own sin, it comes at the end of that. You think, is the priestly blessing gone? Is the Lord really blessing and keeping his people, making his face to shine upon them, lifting his face over them? Doesn't look like it. And then Balaam, after this hilarious farcical negotiation with the angel, the donkey, Balak, and who knows what else, ends up almost forcibly prophesying blessing over the people of God because the word of God has not been revoked. And so he just says to Balak, I'm sorry, God is not a man that he could lie. So if he has blessed, I can't change it. And I'm literally trying. You're giving me money, and I'm standing at the top of a hillside, and I'm trying to curse them, and I can't do it. Because the promises of God to bless his people are so secure that nothing I do and nothing you pay me to do can have any power over it. And then, of course, eventually Balak disappears. He's just fed up with the shenanigans and Balaam Balaam makes his final word and just says, I can see him, but not now. A star will arise out of Jacob and a scepter will rise from Israel. And he's actually going to crush the foreheads of all of these people's nations. And he's going to possess, the, he's going to be the conqueror of cities. There is going to be a messianic ruler from this nation. And I can't stop it. And neither can Balak. So the, the, the challenges, this fight, the, the desire to persevere in obedient faith and then have to resolve conflict and all of those ordinary church life challenges are sandwiched in the structure of numbers between these enormous words of blessing that override the entire structure of all of this, the, the sin that's going on in the book. 
And the message is that no matter unbelief, pride, unbelief, pride, whichever way the pendulum swings, God's blessing over his people cannot be stopped no matter what you do and no matter what mistakes you make. The Lord is not a man that he should lie. And these promises aren't based on your ability to lead the people wisely through them. They're based on his commitment that goes back to Abraham and before that he will have a people from all nations and he is going to bless them no matter what you or anybody else decides to do about it. And the ultimate sign of that commitment to bless his people and to overturn the cycle of unbelief and pride is this man, the man that Balaam was so, he prophesied, but Balak was so frightened of, the star of Jacob, the scepter from Israel, the Lord Jesus. He, he had a wilderness temptation story of his own, right? He gets taken out into the wilderness and he gets tempted to pride. Hey, make these stones become bread. Jump off the top of the table. He gets tempted to unbelief. Do you really trust that God's going to do it this way? Then why don't you just do it yourself? Why don't you take a shortcut? Why don't you bow down and worship me? He gets tested both ways. Satan goes into unbelief. He goes into pride. Jesus resists perfectly. And then he provides the assembled masses with bread from heaven and says, here it is. I'll feed thousands of people in a desert place where there's no food and no water. I will be the living water from the rock to you. You want water? Yeah, I'll give you living water. And if you knew what that was, you'd never ask for the other stuff at all. I will provide you with victory from the promised land. I'm going to send out 12 of my spies. And they're going to go up and down the land, casting out demons, healing the sick, preaching the kingdom. It's going to come. I'm going to nail this. I'm going to do everything that Israel was supposed to do and failed. Like Moses, he prays for and heals leprous rebels. Like Miriam, like the lepers. Like Aaron, he stands between the living and the dead. And the plague of God's judgment is stopped. Like the bronze serpent, he gets lifted high up on a pole so that people, anybody who looks to him, might find healing from having been bitten by the snake of sin. And then by rising from the dead and ascending into heaven and pouring out his spirit, he gives the church the power to live in the same way he did, to go humbly onward. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the promises of God that never fail for the Spirit who guides us through the wilderness, and for the Son of Man who came to seek and save what was lost and to be everything we couldn't be in living wisely as a leader and even just as a follower in this life. While we are in the wilderness, may we imitate him. Lord, may we inherit the land flowing with milk and honey. Every last one of us, may everyone in the churches we care for inherit that land. And in the meantime, may we receive your gifts with gratitude. May we trust you when you tell us to. May we be humble and may we be courageous that we might see all you have to be done through us in this generation. In Jesus' name, amen.